Welcome to Bread and Roses, everyone. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. In this week's program, we'll be talking about the 11th February anniversary of the Iranian Revolution. And lessons to be learned, what to do and what not to do. Yeah, definitely. And we'll also be talking about an insane fatwa against international book fairs. And our slice of life is of a Yazidi child being reunited with his grandparents. And we have a clip from Mariam's um, speech or in a debate in Noreen Bergen a, a while back on essence of resistance against um, Islamism and why this needs to be recognized. Stay with us. Eleventh February is the anniversary of the Iranian Revolution, and as we know, there are events taking place in Iran. It's outrageous, in my opinion, because the reality of the matter is that eleventh February is the anniversary of the Iranian Revolution, of a people's revolution against the Shah's dictatorship. It was suppressed and slaughtered a lot of the revolutionaries by the Islamic movement. So, for them to be celebrated as an Islamic revolution, just makes me feel physically sick really especially because when you look at a lot of um, you know history when victors write history they rewrite it in a way that is unrecognizable really yeah, and, and one of the main elements of the 1978-79 uh, uprising in Iran was the you know genuine uh, um, demand of people um, for better life so you had huge mass strikes by oil workers, you had, uh, you know, demonstration for women's rights, you had students fighting for, you know, better education and the freedom of expression in university, all of those. Of course, the Islamists were organizing as well, but the main element of the Iranian revolution has been erased from the history by the Islamists. And, and when you look at the history a few years after the uh, 1979, that's where the actual Islamic revolution has started, with suppressing the real revolution yeah. that existed and massacre of political prisoners. 1981 was one of the main points. Yeah, 20th that. June 1981, in fact, is the date that should be the anniversary of the Islamic Republic because they managed to maintain their power via mass executions and, and really slaughtering an entire generation in Iran. And the, the reality of it is that that's how they've managed to survive in Iran through constant and continuous and ongoing human rights violations. And that's a characteristic of the Islamist movement anywhere. Absolutely. I think one of the key points um, I think we need, we need to highlight is a reality that cannot be uh, denied that uh, quite a lot of the dominant uh, supposedly left groups at the time supported the Islamists or they were silent they did not criticize the Islamists when they were trying to organize as a quite an organized group uh, political group and they uh, compromised with them and that's one of the reasons that the the genuine revolution in Iran in 1979 failed in a way and Islamists managed to get power because they compromised with it at the same time that we we are constantly the lessons of those days when we we're constantly talking to people sort of do not compromise with Islamists under any circumstances these are these are right wing fascists of the Middle East and this is this is the point that we're trying to make yeah. day in day out in our TV program and anything and criticize the so called left who are very close to um, uh, the Islamist in Europe and and you could see that, that, that but also that, don't forget that the one of the reasons too that the Islamists were able to take power in Iran was because it fit very well with a US foreign policy at the time to create an Islamic or green belt around the Soviet Union then and so there are all of these different sure. things that yes. are con that, that continue to work today as well you know yeah. US militarism's role in perpetrating Islamism as well as the the, the so-called left sections of the left's yeah. role in legitimizing and apologizing and, and, for the Islamists. And joining the counter-revolution and I think these are the lessons you could see that has been very much learned by the ruling elite and ruling class in uh, internationally in different countries. You know, either they bar barrel bomb the uh, you know society or the cities that are protesting, you've seen we've seen that in Syria, or they come and take over the revolution and you can see elements of this in the uh, Europe as well. For the the right-wing elite suddenly they become the voice of the disenfranchised and marginalised in the society, and they try to speak in about in the 
in the, uh, in the name while they are sort of implementing the um, the uh, main maintaining the power and implementing the policies and procedures. So you'll see, uh, you know, the Brexit is talking about the uh, in the name of uh, the marginalised and disenfranchised in in England. You'll see the um, um, Trump talking about that. You know, he represents people who um, have not. Um, um, you know, they haven't got, they haven't got any, anything left in. Uh, I mean, I, I think if we're talking about the Iranian Revolution too, I think it's important that we commemorate it. It's it was an important revolution. Its effects are still felt in the world today. You know, and if you look at the wonderful movements of resistance in Iran, whether it's for labor rights, whether it's for women's liberation, whether it is for children's rights against executions and you know, the death penalty against Islamism, Sharia laws, and so on and so forth. It is a, a revolution that needs to be supported. Supporting the Islamists, though, is supporting the counter-revolutionary forces. And I think that is hugely key, that we need to keep the memory of the revolution arrive, alive. It's a revolution that is ongoing to, in a large extent. To, to some extent, it was defeated in, in itself, was defeated. Mm -hmm. but, but the remains of it is still exist, and we need to... You know, unearth all of these things from the 1978-79 experience, and that experience needs to be looked at and what to do and what not to do for the next round. A while back, I was at an international festival in Bergen, Norway, where I discussed on a panel the issues around violence against women, uh, women's liberation movement, and this idea that people are reduced to homogenized identities and therefore the huge amounts of resistance and dissent that takes place day in and day out is invisible to a lot of people. Yeah, I think recognizing, recognizing this dissent, recognizing the huge and vast resistance that exists that challenges uh, Islamists, misogyny, the right wing across Europe and, um, and, and Middle East and North Africa. Recognition of this reality, in fact, is a precondition for any decent, establishing a decent human society. I yeah. mean, that's so important. Yeah. And I think one of the other things is when you are so focused on you know, the sort of identity politics that sees people not as complex human beings with so many different characteristics, but as a sort of with characteristics that are essentialized, that are unchangeable, predefined. That, predefined. that are predefined, exactly, definitely. You don't get to see the, the sort of common um, uh, humanity and, and the common values that we all have. And it's set up to divide us so that we seem to be unreachable. You and, know? and that's part of the clash of uh, um, civilization narrative. Yeah. That supposedly you have two poles, they are antithetical to each other, they're fighting each other. It's not true that actually the feed, those two right wing fee, uh, from Islamists from the Middle East and North Africa to the right wing in Europe and America, they, they actually feed each other. Uh, from each other, they actually use the same methods. Yeah, they're mirror they're not, images of they, each other. Exactly, yeah. and after they're recognizing this fact, in opposition to these two, these huge and vast uh, humanity, North Africa, Middle East, uh, um, Europe, America, they are actually resisting these mm. definitions, these uh, stereotyping, these you know putting people in pigeonholes. That's you know that's the reality. That's the true narrative of the society that we live under. Yeah, let's watch this uh, uh, section of this video clip now. Stay with us. Mariam, is that a, an experience you share? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, when you do deal with issues that are considered taboo, um, when you touch that which is deemed to be sacred, uh, you do uh, <coughs> get this sort of uh, pushback. Uh, I know uh, many times I've been told, well, if you get death threats, well, what do you expect? Mm. You shouldn't be talking about these issues. You know they're sensitive. You, you know, get death threats. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anybody who deals with, uh, particularly when it comes with Islam, and I want to add here, not that Islam is any worse than any other religion. I think all religions are equal and equally bad. Uh, and I also think, uh, you know, I've said many times, I think 
religion, uh, <laughs> religion should come with a health warning like cigarettes, you know, it kills. <laughs> Stay away from it, if possible. So I, I don't think Islam is any worse. I do think it's worse possibly only because it has more political power. And we are going through what I call an Islamic inquisition, similar to the Spanish inquisition of the past. So um, I do find that when you are dealing with these issues, people do say, well, you shouldn't have spoken about it. We've had uh, our let's say we've had a public meeting and Islamists have come and threatened us and the security guard has said, well, what do you expect when you're talking about Sharia? Mm -hmm. um, and so on and so forth. So I find that, you know, there is this effort to, uh, to, to silence and censor people who are talking about really um, issues that need to be talked about and need to be discussed. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we're always facing the sort of pushback. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I would just like to add to that that it's, you have that one act of speaking out against something and then you, know, you, you receive that kind of treatment. But very often, it's also just being a woman is a provocation in itself. It's not necessarily that you say something, it's just the fact that you are a woman, mm -hmm. you are in the public space, just being a woman mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that in itself is a reason enough you know so i think it's when it comes to women's role within that space i think it's very very specific uh, how women are targeted and that women are targeted as, as ferociously as they are it's very easy i mean we sit here and talk and i mean we are not targeted right now are we or mariam mm. what do you mean you're not what kind of threats do you get um i mean I, I hate talking about threats because I think um, the Islamists, they feed off of people feeling afraid of them. And that's one way in which they help to silence and suppress dissent. Um, and I think people are very afraid of them. I'm, I'm always surprised at how many people are afraid of them. Uh, when I started the Council of Ex-Muslims of yeah. Britain, which is an organization of people leaving Islam, doing it publicly because there are threats around it, I was amazed at how many people, men and women, who were born in Britain, who were afraid to, to come out publicly. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the threats are a reality, but there's also a lot of support and a lot of dissent. Mm -hmm. And I think my problem is that the threats are what we see, but we never see all that dissent that takes place, mm -hmm. primarily actually by women, mm -hmm. because women are the first targets of the religious right in any context, whether it's the Buddhist right, the Christian right, the Jewish right, and the is Islamic right. And the dissenters, whether they're in Iran or Algeria or Pakistan or Nigeria, mm -hmm. and from immigrant communities here in Europe, that resistance is so great. Um, but on the other hand, it's very, often very invisible mm -hmm. in mainstream society. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need to stress more because it's, it's very, a very hopeful thing mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me and us a little bit more about your work? Uh, I, I was born in Iran, and so I um, was raised in a Muslim family. I was born Muslim, as children are, unfortunately, in this world. Uh, children uh, are not communist children or uh, conservative children or labor children, but they are always some sort of religion, and that is the privilege that religion has in our world today. And so I was born a Muslim out of no choice of my own, and I think most people are born into religion out of no choice of their own. And, um, you know, but again, I was, uh, religion was not a problem in the sense that I wasn't made to veil, I lived in Iran, I went to a mixed school, um, you know, religious people are not necessarily psychos and fanatics. It's the, the, the religious right that are, and I think it's important to make that distinction. And for me, religion only became very clear when you know, the Islamists took power in Iran, where then I had to veil, then we had uh, someone from the Hezbollahs come to our school to separate the boys and girls, because it's so sinful to have boys, even though we're children, um, to mix. And so I think it was there that for me it became very clear that religion in power is just really bad news, and it's just something that I need to fight against. And so in the various things I've done, it's whether it's one law for all and demanding secular laws for everybody, um, as well as citizenship rights or universal rights, mm -hmm. to challenging Islamism's apostasy laws via the Council of Ex-Muslims, or, you know, women's mm -hmm. equality via groups like mm -hmm. FITNA and so mm -hmm. on and so forth, yeah. You told me earlier that your organization is 
sort of, it's not in vogue, it's, it's invisible still. Why? I think a lot of the work we do and also the resistance of women and men in, in the Middle East and North Africa and South Asia, I think it, it's because it doesn't fit the narrative that we're often um, told about, which is the multicultural narrative. I, I hate multiculturalism. I love that we, you know, not multiculturalism as a lovely lived experience where we have people from all over the world living together. I am on the left, I want open borders. But multiculturalism as a social policy that separates and divides people and, you know, divides the groups into communities. So there is this Muslim community and the Muslim community is seen to be homogeneous and it's the you know, parasitical imams and the reactionary Islamic organizations that are seen to be the self-appointed leaders of these communities. And so what happens is there's no space for dissent the dissent becomes invisible. The women who don't want to be veiled, the women who don't want to be killed in the name of honor, uh, the fathers and mothers who don't want to kill their children in the name of honor, that all becomes invisible in a sense. And I think this is what multiculturalism has done and cultural relativism in a way. It's taken away our citizenship and our shared humanity. And it's important, I think, to go back to basics, you know, where people matter before religion, mm -hmm. religious identity and culture and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Thank you. But how come that such misogyny ideas can actually be spread and seem to gain force? I mean, killing a woman because she, she was not a virgin on the, the wedding night it's such a horror. And how can that be spread now in a modern time, do you think? I mean, we think we'll, we are modern right now. And it seems as if such ideas gain power uh, for the time being. Yeah. It could also be a reaction to modernity, though. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it can also be a reaction to globalization, a reaction to to modernity, but also a, a reaction, a, a, a way of sort of regaining and holding on to a sense of masculinity and a sense of what that means, how do men fit into the world, how, how do, well, violent men, mm -hmm. how, what is my place in a community that's now becoming more fluid and mm -hmm. shifting? Women are starting to become educated, mm -hmm. women are starting to mm -hmm. enter the workforce, even if your women in your family aren't, but the surrounding ones are. Mm -hmm. The world is changing, mm -hmm. and so I think there's a reaction mm -hmm. to that, and that's why, in, on one hand, we should be, you know, it seems obvious that these very, brutal practices should be diminishing, mm. but the fact that they're growing, I think, is exactly because we are a modern world mm. and because we are progressing in a certain way. Mm. But, but also, can I just add, I mean, I think that the problem also is the fact that misogyny is, uh, is imposed by the law and the state mm. in many instances. I mean, uh, if you look at Sharia law, it is a form of terrorism mm. against uh, the population at large and particularly mm. women. Mm. And so in that sense, it's, you know, domestic violence, honor killing is the law in many countries. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a prerogative of, um, of uh, you know, men. Mm -hmm. And again, not to say that all men accept violence. I think there are a lot of men who are pro-women's rights and a lot of women who are misogynist. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it goes beyond that. But I also want to add that, you know, there, the sort of... Um, the other side of it is, if you look at just one example, if I can give you, you know, the Afghan woman Farhunde, who was uh, beaten and stoned and burned and her car run over her body and thrown in the river in Afghanistan recently, if you recall her case, uh, you know, she... Uh, was actually very devout herself and she had gone to the local imam to tell him off for you know selling superstition to mm -hmm. to other women and he accused her of being an infidel and burning mm -hmm. the Quran and then a mob killed her but if you look at the reaction after that you know where you had women carrying her a coffin and burying her it mm -hmm. goes against Islamic yeah. custom but they they agreed mm -hmm. they did that with the approval of her family and men surrounded the women carrying her coffin. Yeah, um, yeah. And there was a ver the, the most influential imam of that area, he tried to come into her um, 
burial, even though he had initially said that she deserved to die. And the women surrounded her coffin and didn't let him come next to her coffin, and they pushed him out. And you know what? So you know they put a tree where she was buried, and uh, young people, boys, men, and women, they called the street where she was killed Farh on this street. So what I want to say is that there is this misogyny, but there is also this resistance to it. So there is not just one Afghanistan. There is not just one Muslim community. <coughs> there is this constant fight in families, in neighborhoods, in communities, in societies at large, and it's important for us to see. You know that this this demand for universal rights is a demand that people are having in the, in the smallest villages mm -hmm. in you know far away corners of the world as well. Mm -hmm. Sheikh Abdul Rahman and Nasser Al Barak. That name sounds really familiar. From last week. From last week and from many, many weeks. Uh, he has uh, issued a fatwa against the Riyadh a book fair. And he says that it's a sin to organize it, to go to it, to defend it, to read any of those books. And he's worse than the book, his imitation of the Western book fairs. And, and, and he's worse than the Western book fairs. Much worse. Do you much know why? Worse. Why? <laughs> Because it's got it's, books in there? No, well, yes, that's <laughs> that too. Books are in there, mm. and the infidel books and atheist books are on sale. Mm. No, but he's, he's, more, he's more worried about the fact that men and women will be under <gasps> one roof. Oh that's gosh. why. And oh, this is not good, you know. It's just this, difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Books are bad. Books are just really, really bad. Don't read it's so don't, sinful. And don't, don't read your children books because this guy gets upset. And, and not only that, it's if, especially if you're respectable. Of course, if you're not respectable, you can go ahead and read books. But if you're respectable, you shouldn't do it. Stupid. Fine. This week's Slice of Life is of a wonderful, heartbreaking, yet inspiring footage of a Yazidi child who is reunited with his grandparents. It does remind us of the tragedy that has befallen so many families, but it's also so inspiring and hopeful because, you know, there is a light at the end of that tunnel for that family at least. And, and a lot of good work is being um, undertaken at the moment in different parts of Syria to bring people back together to reunite families and, uh, you know, go over the war, which is really, really horrible. It has been horrible in the, uh, in the life of the Syrian people, but the, the light is there, humanity will survive. We have no doubt about it, despite the difficulty. So this is a moment that everybody should rejoice on and look to the future. And as you said, there's a lot more work to be done. A lot more families need to be reunited. You know, the whole situation there has to change for people to be able to have the rights and lives that they deserve. But it's great to see that image of that one family. It, Been reunited. It's, yes, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. We hope you enjoyed the discussions we had in this week's program. We look forward again to seeing you at the same time and same place next week. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. 
It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.